All right. Uh, this is the beginning of a multi-video episode, segment, piece, whatever. Um, the Beginner's Guide to Mark 1 Volkswagens. Uh, more specifically, Rabbits, just because that's what I have. Uh, the Jettas and Convertibles are pretty similar. Um, but um, everything you want to know when it comes to looking at buying one, actually buying one, and what it takes to own one. Um, so. so first and foremost, we will start off by going over some of the things you want to look at if you're interested in buying one, if you're actually going to look at one in person, um, some of the questions you want to ask if you can't see it in person, um, and yeah, you know, main things being rust, where to look for rust, what things I personally think don't matter anymore, and some of the things that do matter the most. We're not going to dive into the differences in years and headlights and all that stuff just yet. That's going to be in this same beginner's guide to rabbits. Just going to be a separate video. Uh, just right now, we're going to talk what stuff you want to look for, what stuff you want to look at when looking to buy one of these. So first and foremost, rust is the number one killer of these cars. Aside from it, it's on the road. Um, In my opinion, the most concerning spot is the shut tower area. Not just the shut towers, because it also applies to where the firewall meets the back of the shut tower. So, or, you know, for lack of better terms, the whole front clip. So, it's spot welded on there or welded on however it's attached. That's a big area of concern for these cars. No matter what year, they tend to rot out in that valley and it gets so bad that this whole front section will basically become separated from the rest of the car obviously the shut towers themselves are are a common place to look on just about any car but that's that's the obvious one people often overlook what's going on back there in terms of the shut tower itself you'll so you'll most often see i can't english most frequently you'll see um, bubbling where the shut tower meets. Around the seam sealer, sometimes you'll get it down here, the sport truck's got a hole right there, but um, you know, most commonly it'll be in there. The other place, which you can't see too well because the wheel's on, is that inner wheel well. It's two layers of metal here, at least more than one layer. So if there's something on the other side, you won't see it on this side. Um, that whole inner well is coated with this seam sealer glue, which is supposed to protect from rust and rot, but once it does start rusting and rotting under there, it actually hides it and makes it tricky when looking at these cars to buy. I uh, don't mind this just sitting on top here. I'm trying to troubleshoot a running issue with the carb. Stole this off the sport truck. It's welded on there, so I can't just slap, take it off and slap it on. Um, so but anyways, when you go to look at one of these cars, you want to go poking around with a screwdriver or something. I'm not telling you to show up to some dude's house and start stabbing away at his pride and joy because you're an idiot. Um, don't be that guy. Obviously, do this at your own discretion. But if there's a small bubble, nine times out of ten, it's going to be worse than it first appears on these cars. I have yet to see one of these cars that the rust isn't as bad as it first appears. These cars hide rust really well. That's probably the trickiest part when looking at one of these cars. Um... When in doubt, I personally suggest don't buy the car. I don't like dealing with rust buckets. Um, I don't know anybody who says they love to. Personally, it's not worth my time. I, uh, I won't buy rusty cars to try and save. It's not worth it. Now, I'm not saying run for the hills if you see a rust hole about that big, somewhere insignificant like the bottom of the fender. Um, that's not a big deal breaker in my opinion. Just all the time I see people thinking... A little bit of rust here and up on the structural points is not that big of a deal. And it is. It is a big deal. Um, some people have more resources and skills than others and can take on replacing the whole front clip. I know a few people who have done it, and I've seen it plenty of other times. You can replace the whole front clip and fix 90% of the rust up front. Me, personally, not worth it. 
I won't do that. You won't ever see me take that on. You won't ever see me advise somebody buying a car that needs a whole new front clip. It's a waste of time, waste of money. Um, better cars out there. So the next important spot to check for rust is this windshield frame, the surround, whatever you want to call it. But these cars are prone to rusting and rotting on this lower corner. I feel like I've seen mostly driver sides rusting out. Um, never really up top, unless it's a total Swiss cheese rot box. Um, so the corners, and I've seen in the middle, you can see here on my car, it's a little something fun going on under there. I'm not gonna mess with that because that's that can be a can of worms. It doesn't leak, I'm gonna leave it alone until. Uh, right, so the next uh, super crucial spot to check major structural point as well are the floors specifically where the control arm mounts um they can these cars can rot out so bad that this whole mounting point just becomes separated from the car um you don't see it often but i have seen it and that car just parted out had some iffy stuff going around in that area um so these floors can rot out these this section isn't a big deal you know the actual flat part of the floor not a big deal easy to replace it's all patch panels but like i said some of these cars can rot out so bad that your suspension components can fall off essentially and that as well is a can of worms that most people cannot uh, afford to open both financially and uh, with their skill level it's worth mentioning that uh, these hatches can rot out, of course, around the glass, but that's a re easily replaceable. Um, on a car like this, finding one that will match, that's a different story, but not, not the point I'm trying to make. Uh, half of the time you can get away with just finding a new hatch. Same thing goes for the doors. So that stuff isn't as important. So just to recap, the shut towers, where the shut towers and firewall meet, those wheel wells uh, specifically poke around that's all that seam sealer uh, body glue whatever you want to call it because um, very often rust and rot will hide in there I've seen plenty of people have a little bubble or have nothing at all show and then they go to restore their rabbit and strip all that glue off and it's just a giant window you know stick your whole hand through sort of hole uh, that seam sealer, unfortunately, is really good at hiding rot. Um, the floors, more specifically, where that control arm mounts to the floor. Uh, and, you know, pretty much everywhere else that you can think of, poke around, take a good look. The spare tire walls are known to rust out on these, these cars. cars. Aside from that, everything else is replaceable on them. I mean... The car is only original once, so if you're looking at something totally restored, this doesn't so much apply to that. Um, this car is a prime example of a survivor. West Coast car, uh, original paint. It's got some cool decals on it. Um, as you guys know from the torture test video, this is not the same motor anymore. Uh, these cars are like Legos. That's one thing that you need to realize. All the time on, on the forums and I guess just Facebook page nowadays, uh, you get people asking how many miles, how many miles, how many miles. Look, these cars are so old, mileage really doesn't matter. Now, this doesn't apply to all the cars. You know, there's obviously some super low mile, uh, very well preserved cars that obviously doesn't apply to them. Um, but these clusters break all the time. They stop working, they freeze. You should be able to tell the difference and chances are if somebody's claiming low mileage on one of these cars, they should be able to prove it. If they can't prove it, take it with a grain of salt. If somebody's claiming low mileage on a car and they don't have the paperwork to back that up or the proof to back that up, um, that's kind of on you and your own discretion to uh, decide whether or not you want to take that seller's word for it or not but me personally nine times out of ten mileage doesn't matter on these cars if it's not the mileage it's the age all of the wearable components should have been changed out by now um, if you're buying a museum piece that's a different story but I mean, this isn't the museum buyer's guide to mark one volkswagens 
this car is kind of a prime example why I feel that way. Um, odometer reads 45,000, still works, works fine. When I got this car, it said about 43,000 on it. Um, not that the paint says low mileage on it and not that when I first got it, I'm like, oh, this is a 40,000 mile car. I just told myself, hey, there's a chance it is. Mainly because when I looked at stuff like how nice these stickers were and the condition of the pedals, you know, the rubber that covers the pedals, the carpet, um, the headliner's dirty, but the headliner's in beautiful shape. Um, just little things like that kind of said to me, hey, this might be a 40,000 mile car. Long story short, I had found something in the owner's manual that basically confirmed the odometer has rolled over at least once. Could have rolled over twice, but I, I feel pretty confident saying this car's got about 140, 150,000 miles on it. But again, that's kind of irrelevant. All the rubber stuff on this car, all the important things should have been replaced by now. Uh, shocks should have been replaced by now. These cars are like Legos. It's really about as simple as it gets. I mean, you, Hondas are probably a little simpler of this day and age, but debatable. You know, you really shouldn't be telling yourself a 30,000 mile, 40 year old anything is good to go and the money you're spending on that's gonna make you good for the next five years without having to fix anything. Not gonna be the case. Now, for me, the next most important thing is the interior. Um, while yes, you can find better condition stuff and replace it, it it is a bit trickier depending on the car this car for example i've been looking for a replacement driver's seat or at least both seats for a little while now it's trashed so i'm trying to find something of the same color but chances are if i find something of the same color you know it's still gonna have 40 something year old material so um this car in particular is a little tricky to find interior parts the dashboard good luck finding crack free early dashboards door cards are i mean you could almost make these yourself but still uh besides the point in my book interior is the next most important thing everyone's different though if you're building a race car that obviously doesn't matter so just give you guys a quick look at what this car is like inside it's held up great over time. For me, that's a that's a that's a huge plus. That's a huge selling point for me. So again, this, this part especially is just my personal opinion. An interior can make or break the deal for me. Um, yes, it's not like a quarter panel. You know, you you can replace this on your own easily. It's not like you have to drop it off at a body shop to have them redo the interior uh, or swap out the interior. But it's just. It, it's it could take a lot of time and stress out of you trying to find new replacement parts again that depends on the year if you've got a basic 1983 base model rabbit pretty much anything's gonna be an upgrade for you so that's uh you know definitely subjective especially if you're spending you know three four grand on one of these cars obviously depends on your location and many other factors uh you know the value of these cars always a, a touchy subject for a lot of people um but i think that if you're spending over three it should get you a car with at least matching interior and intact interior it doesn't mean the headliner and everything should be in great shape but i think it should all be there um i've seen a handful of times this year alone people asking five six thousand bucks for one of these cars and it doesn't even have a matching color interior which, uh, uh, you know, we could debate the value of these cars all day long. But I think once you're talking that much or more, it should have an intact interior. At least a decent condition interior. These cars are very easy to work on. Doesn't mean um, it's always easy to figure out. For those of you who haven't owned a, an old car... Um, I can't really decide for you if it's something you're cut out for. It takes a certain kind of person not to act like we're should be bowed down to or anything. It just it it takes a lot out of you and it takes some kind of skill to keep one of these on the road, especially if you drive it every day or drive it often. That debate aside though, these cars are forgiving when it comes to learning to work on them. The fuel injection system CIS 
that's debatable. But the mechanics, the suspension, brakes, all that stuff, very easy to work on, very simple to figure out, especially with all the resources on how to do so between the Bentley or just forum posts, uh, motor swaps, especially newer motors like 180s and VR6s have become super easy to do on these cars thanks to people like Eurocraft who makes who make harnesses and uh, you know there's other companies making mount kits that make the whole swap almost plug and play direct bolt in not really direct bolt in but you know you get what I'm saying I guess the point I'm trying to make is uh, rust is the most important thing on these cars condition overall just physical condition of the car is the most important thing I can't say it enough that these cars are like Legos. West Coasters are very fortunate to not have to deal with rust. So when they're looking at one of these cars, it's just a matter of seeing what kind of condition the paint's in, the interior is in, and how well it runs and drives. Northeasters and East Coasters and uh, anywhere else prone to rust, you're kind of just hoping you got a good, decent shell to work with. After that, if it runs and drives, that's just an added bonus in my opinion. Now, I'm not saying to go spend four grand on a car that doesn't run or drive, but it needs something like a transmission or motor. It's not the end of the world, especially if you're a bit mechanically savvy. Aside from the convertibles, they stopped making these cars in 84. So even at the youngest, they're still 34 years old. So if you expect a transmission or motor on anything to be totally flawless and ready to go, you're in for a rude awakening. At the least... Plan on having to do seals and stuff if somebody didn't already do it and doesn't have receipts for them. Now, I don't want to scare anybody away from buying one of these cars because they don't have a ton of experience working on things or don't really want to learn, whatever the reason may be. I know a few people who pay others to do their work, and there's no shame in that. To be honest, if I had the money to spare, I would pay somebody to do all the work on these cars because it gets old, realistically speaking shouldn't be too much more expensive than any other car to pay somebody to work on them. You just got to find somebody who's not going to take advantage of you. And you as an owner uh, and a customer should do the legwork to find and source the parts to perform said work. Um, helps you, helps the person working on the car if they're not super familiar with these cars and don't know the best places to look to get parts. Um, that being said, there is going to be another separate video talking about maintenance specifically. Uh, we're going to go into talking about what tools you want, what websites you want to use to get parts, etc., etc. So, um, stay tuned for all of that. So this next part might be a bit, I don't know, not silly, but redundant, whatever you want to call it. Uh, I'm just going to show you guys real quick what i think is rust and rot and what's bad and what's not all bad. my cars have pretty decent shut towers and don't really have any significant rot to show you i just finished cutting up that other car but just to give you an example i found a bubble on the sport truck recently and it was about you know a bubble about the size of the tip of my finger there maybe a little bit smaller and once i started poking and chipping away at it it ended up being about that big so I have that treated for now when I do have time I will cut it out and weld an actual patch in but for now it's treated it's not gonna get any worse another spot I had to treat kind of rotted but the back of the cab you can see some actual holes too you know like this bubble here if I dig that away, it's gonna open up a little bit. Nothing too bad. Good example to dig into to show you guys, but I don't really feel like making that any worse. Uh, but you can see some bubbling, and it's safe to say if I really start digging into that, it might open up to be about that big. So, um, just this whole part is mainly for you people who aren't sure how to judge rust and how bad it is. Those spots I showed you on the truck, I would definitely consider actual rot. Whereas this is just surface rust. You know, if you go poking away at this, you might find a hole or two. Uh, this might look scary to some, and to a lot of us, this is nothing. It is a bit soft. That's a combination of the thinner metal on these older rabbits. And uh, just, it is a bit soft in terms of rust. 
it's not too bad. I'm sure one day I'll cut this out and replace it. Not too worried about it though. So not to say that that's the gold standard of rust versus rot, just that's those are the two best examples I can show you right now. Again, West Coasters are very lucky. You won't really see much of any of that. And again, a lot of us know the difference between a little bit of surface rust and actual rot. So if you're sitting there saying, oh, duh, that's common sense. Look, for everyone, it isn't. Some people have never seen a rusty car in their life. Some people are looking at buying their first car. So whatever, too bad. This is the beginner's guide to buying an old car. So too bad. that should pretty much cover what you want to know, at least the very basics of what you want to know. If you're going to look at one of these cars and aren't sure what to look for. At the end of the day, always bring somebody with you who at least knows more than you. The more they know, the better. But, you know, don't just rely on what I said to tell you whether or not you should buy a car that you're looking at. That's on you if you buy a shitbox. I could spend all day boring you guys to death talking about every little detail and opinion I have about buying one of these cars for the first time or even the seventh time. So, uh going to try not to do that, but I'm definitely going to break this up into multiple pieces, you know, a bunch of different segments, whatever you want to call it. It is safe to say it's going to get a bit more technical as we go on, though. So, feel free to skip ahead, but if you're wondering about stuff, definitely stay tuned and watch everything I put out the next few videos. Like I said, we're going to get a bit more technical as we go on. I think next we might break into the difference in the years real quick. Not too much to talk about that, but we'll give you the gist of of the different years. Um, more importantly, I'm going to talk about what special tools I think you need. Not really special tools, but there's a relatively short list of tools that you will need in order to really get technical and work on certain things on these cars. You know, once you start talking, doing axles and whatnot, you there are a couple of tools you need that aren't in your everyday toolkit, so... We'll dig into that. Uh, we'll also probably get a little more technical with engine swaps, specifically ABA, or you know, just swapping in another JH, or I mean, another eight valve into your already eight valve. Although I haven't done a one eight T or VR swap myself, with the guys out there making parts and conversion kits, it is super easy. So we'll run through all that. I'll point you guys in the right direction give you the right resources to get it done so that's that um stay tuned for more videos on this beginner's guide that i'm going to slap together